Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show which brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe so you won't miss a new episode. I'm your host, Fritz Bussemaker, and today I'm delighted to have a conversation with Jeff Howe. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. Let me say a couple of words who Jeff is. He's been a journalist for over 20 years, a visiting scholar at MIT Labs in Boston, a, a contributing editor to Wired magazine, where he explores the frontiers of media and technology. Now, he is also the person who coined the term crowdsourcing in 2006. Later wrote a book about that, Crowdsourcing, Why the Power of the Crowd is Driving the Future of Business, which has been translated in 12 languages. And Eric frequently comments on the phenomenon of both media out, uh, in both media outlets on NPR, CNN, and the New York Times. And you live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So again, Jeff, welcome to the show. Great, thanks. And we're going to talk about crowdsourcing, uh, I would say 10, 15 years beyond when the book came out. Um, first of all, as a, as a journalist, uh, how did you come across this topic of crowdsourcing? When did you first see that this is something you needed to write about? Uh, well, you know, there's a, there's a truism amongst journalists, especially magazine writers who tend to spend months and months on a project, which is, um, you know, th your idea for your next project always comes up during your current one. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was true. I was at the time writing about MySpace. And this will date me um, because MySpace at that time uh, was, in fact, not even we didn't have a language to describe it as a as a social media uh, uh, network. Uh, you know, there there had been something called Friendster in 2004, which I, I, I think we could identify as sort of a proto um, social media network. Uh, MySpace had actually been created as a way for models and musicians living in Los Angeles uh, to connect with, uh, essentially to sort of circumvent, the, uh, management and book their own gigs and find, connect directly to fans. And you can see sort of a, you know, a, a social media thinking there. Um, but it had wound up disrupting the music industry because it was, it had proven to be wildly successful in ways that I, I don't think the founders even understood, uh, and in fact, I you know started working on the article in April 2005. By the time I was filing the article, or you know putting kind of putting it to bed, as we say, uh, in late summer, uh, we were calling it a social media network. And MySpace had grown from like a million users to 20 million. It was something completely insane. The exponential growth just over the time I was the few months that I was writing the article. Um, at that time, I was spending. Uh, I was I was basically just hanging out with emo bands on the on the Vans Warped tour, uh, going uh, you know from places like Cleveland to uh, you know the Pompano, California. We there there was a gig, and I just got to know the bands and their fans. Uh, and what was immediately evident, hanging out with uh, you know all these 17, 18 year old kids, was that they had a really different relationship with the tools of production than than my generation generation X had had. Um, where, you know, if if you needed a video made, uh, you required the the skills of a videographer, um, and. Uh, you know, we were amidst a consumer revolution and a consumer electronics revolution that we're, we're still very much in, um, in which a, a lot of the means of production fell into the hands of consumers. And so I felt that that was going to trigger or had already triggered uh, or was kind of in, in the process of triggering uh, a transformation in the relationship between producers and consumers. And that, and and in fact, the, uh, sort of a a, a there were, there was an emergent language to describe this transformation. I definitely wasn't the only one making this observation. Um, so the 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 term prosumer, a lot of the language has been dropped at this point. Um, sort of you know uh, attempts at uh, you know uh, uh, you know new 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 slang that never took. Uh, but 
you know, this idea of the prosumer, this idea, you know, user generated content, which, uh, you know, I, I guess we still call it, but so much of what we now consume is, I mean, all of TikTok is user generated content. So the tail now wags the dog in this way. Um, uh, but at any rate, it, it was evident that this was going to be much larger uh, than, you know, silly pet videos on YouTube, which is 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 essentially the, was the state of crowdsourcing in 2005. Uh, so so I, I, you know, I told my editor, look, I think we need to write about this. And I think we need, need a much more expansive and broader nomenclature. We need a way to describe something that could include people uh, you know, declining to hire an architect and doing their own design and like Google SketchUp, yeah. uh, as well as, uh, you know, companies uh, that are using prize format models uh, in order to spur innovation and conduct scientific research. Uh, and, uh, you know, my editor had said, it's like outsourcing to the crowd. And I said, or crowdsourcing. Um, and the, the punchline is that I was kidding. Like I, 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 I'm very much an East coast kind of guy. Uh, and I thought Silicon Valley was very silly for, uh, you know, smooshing yeah. perfectly good words together. And, and, but my editor was like, no, that's really good. Let's, uh, you know, let's run that up the flagpole at Wired. Uh, and a few months later I, I had an assignment to, uh, and, and, and then it was months in the making, actually, it was, it was, uh, it, it was not evident that crowdsourcing was a thing in 2006 uh, until I found the it, the case study of, or well, basically created a case study. There hadn't been a business case study written yet, but um, on uh, iStock Photo and stock photography, which was really the first proper industry. It was at that time a two billion dollar a year industry uh, to be to be really disrupted by by the crowd by crowdsourcing okay. so, so just for the audience i mean um first of all can you give a definition of uh, crowdsourcing uh so that we all talk in the, uh, along the same terms and then explain yeah. what iStock is doing so you, as an example of, sure. of crowdsourcing sure i mean I, I think the definition we used you know now 15 years ago is a little bit long in the tooth but uh you know i can give it um which is that it, it's it's an act uh, you know once performed by professionals uh, that has been outsourced to a large and crucial term here undefined group of people uh, generally over the internet and generally for low or no pay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and partially because we did define it that way, you know, be uh, sort of you know what we used to call first mover advantage or maybe business schools still use that term. I, you know, I, I was allowed to kind of create, uh, you know, to help frame how we think of crowdsourcing. So that's, so that's probably still how people generally use that term. Yeah. It's probably, I, I imagine, it's, I, I haven't looked at the Webster's definition, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I imagine it's probably pretty close to it. Oh, okay. But uh, so in my take, you, you did come up with, you, you coined the, ter the term, so it landed in, uh, in Webster. Uh, as a journalist, I would imagine that made you feel just a little bit proud to get to create sure. the word. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful and and proud uh, of, of you know, not so much the. I mean, the initial article was, it's far from the best thing I've ever written. I mean, it's fine. It's, uh, but the reporting was actually really difficult. I mean, we actually did almost kill it several times because we just didn't think it seemed very speculative. That we, you know, we were saying uh, that this was going to be a new model of economic uh, production, uh, and I mean, that's quite a claim. <laughs> you know, those don't come along that often. Um, you know, that this was a, a, a transformational tweak to capitalism, um, and uh, and and I just it, only because I just wouldn't stop calling and asking people about it. Did finally I talked to someone who was like, you should look at what's happening in stock photography. $2 billion is not a large industry. That's the, that's the size of, uh, just to give you an example, uh, circa 2006, that was the size of the global uh, market for orchids. So orchids and stock photos, that's $2 billion is nothing. It's a tiny industry. So I would have never known to look. And, and people were, even though I was in publishing, people just weren't talking that much about the fact that a stock photo that had been going for about $300 for a single use license was yeah. now going for a dollar. I mean, it was a major change and it was simply because of the crowd. It was because there were 
you know, you had these upstart uh, stock agencies like iStock Photo, um, and I'm trying to, I can't remember some of the other ones. Uh, I think iStock is iStock was later purchased by Getty, yeah. um, and uh, so it it um, you know was really transformational model instead of instead of having a thousand really great photos they just offered a hundred thousand photos of varying ranges okay. um some of which were great and some of which weren't but it turns out you know the, the consumer appreciated the choice we're going to continue talking about crowdsourcing but i realize it's just one of the projects you have done as a journalist and there are lots of others out there great projects but so sticking with uh, crowdsourcing just a little bit further. Um, uh, I also remember that time um, that we, people were talking about, yeah, the, the crowd, the community, they just, uh, you, you just give a, a little bit of your time and you get a lot of return. So it was very much free labor in return for so-called kudos. Uh, but I also saw people organizations taking advantage of that. Um, is that something uh, and later you also uh, described and wrote, uh, so see, seeing the downside of this uh, phenomenon? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say that I was guilty at the time of, um, you know, I mean, the, the article was very neutral. The, the article really proposed, this is a thing that's happening. Um, uh, you know, there was no intent of, of, you know, there was no moral component in the article. It was, you know, as most journalists were trained not to do that. We just, here's a phenomenon, make, make of it what you will. Uh, you know, as, as, as a book author, uh, you know, I, I wear a different hat and, and my book on crowdsourcing was, you know, uh, was, I had a pretty rosy view of it. I mean, I saw as, as many other people did too, who were covering technology at that time, um, you know, saw it as a force of good, um, that it would, it would have, that, that the democratization of information um, would have a uh, similarly democratizing effect on, on governments, um, and uh, that it would, uh, you know, offer a lot of opportunity and innovation um, you know, uh, across all sectors of society. Um, I did not foresee that it would be a tool for the continued aggregation of capital um, and, and wealth inequality, which is, is how it's played out in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, that's, I, I don't flatter myself that, uh, you know, that, that Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you know, was was reading crowdsourcing as as a playbook. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised to find that he had never read my book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the book did pretty well, but you know, it was not it was it was it was not the number one bestseller that year or anything. Um, uh, it's 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 more that I had failed to see the ways in which this model of, as you put it, Fritz, of essentially trading forms of labor or at least things of value. You know, our, our, be, our consumer behavior is not labor exactly, uh, you know, or what we look at online is not labor, uh, but, but it is something of value we possess and it's, it's our behavioral data. And I did not foresee that that would be crowdsourced uh, for, 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 for gain. Um, and I think that's a trade-off that we didn't make uh, willingly. I had foreseen crowdsourcing as, as for the most part, uh, involving willing participants, willing that people had opted into a crowdsourcing effort. Um, I had not seen the extent to which passive crowdsourcing, what we could think of as passive crowdsourcing, would become its dominant form, which has been the case, where things are crowdsourced from us, whether we want them to be or even know yep. that they are or, or not. And then some company somewhere creates value over the aggregation of of of. of you know what they've crowdsourced. And so, so specifically the the passive form usage you mentioned, uh, which we now discuss as you're giving away your data, uh, you're giving away all your private information in change for a freebie or access to a website you like. Uh, that's that's a phenomenon. I think the world is now understanding, and it 
uh, we understand the role echo chambers have uh, as a part where the crowd comes together and they get exploited. Uh, it gave us Cambridge Analytics probably. Yeah. Uh, so those are the downsides. Now, you just said as a journalist, the piece is agnostic, neutral. Um, even if you didn't write, write crowdsourcing, do you also see as a journalist a need to maybe point out uh, not only the positive sides, but also the negative sides? So like good news is news. Hey, guys. This is something uh, we need to uh, cover, make people aware of. Uh, you know, it's not where, you know, my research has taken me in recent years. And I mean, I think if there were a, a dearth of people pointing that out, um, sure, I would. Yeah. I would say, you know, someone had, you know, look, there's a fire break broken out. Like someone has to, you know, get people out yeah. of the building. Um, uh, but lots of people are screaming fire. I don't know how many people are listening. Um you know, but th this is, uh, you know, th th this phenomenon. Um, I mean, b I I'm not sure people call it crowdsourcing, and I, I don't think that really matters. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, our, our you know, uh, data capitalism, um, okay. you know, uh, surveillance yeah. capitalism has received a lot of attention. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that I could do uh, as uh, a better job of it than other other journalists and thinkers and okay. are, are but, really done. But you are also a professor in journalism. So I was wondering, um, and I now also see crowdsourcing being used uh, to benefit uh, normal newspapers. So we have a lot of news coming from social media. So the, the citizen journalism, uh, you also see the whole phenomenon of data-driven journalism. Uh, the Guardian is a prime example of a newspaper who's who's combining that. Uh, so it's an effective putting crowdsourcing to good use. So is this yeah. something you also see in your profession? Um, is this a, a, an exception or is this the way it's going at the moment? No, I think, um, you know, I, I think when crowdsourcing is applied to journalism, it has been largely a, a positive development. Um, it has uh, broken down a, a barrier that had existed between the producers of news and the consumers of news um, for a long time. Uh, and, and so an acknowledgement that uh, news producers and news consumers are in a much more complex relationship uh, and uh, you know, a, a, a greater involvement in, in news consumers and in, 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 in how news is, is produced and distributed. Uh, has been welcome. I mean, I think it's improved news products, frankly. Uh, you know, but that that too has not been without a lot of bumps. I mean, we foresaw 15 years ago that uh, that simply opening up comments uh, to to news articles would result in Socratic dialogue in which you know, well-meaning, uh, yeah. you know, citizens, uh, you know, debated the relevant topics and, and informed the reporters and editors of, of new story ideas and, and other complexities and nuances that the, the article itself had missed. Uh, and in fact, basically it devolved into racist name calling. Um, it turned out that the only people who reliably were commenting on news articles were probably the three or 4% of humanity that you're really glad you don't have to uh, you, you know, share more than uh, a bus or, or a, you know, commuter train ride with. Like they, you know, they aren't people you want marrying your son or daughter. Uh, you know, I mean, there are some awful people out there. And it seems that most of the awful people want to comment on news articles. So, uh, uh, you know, that that's there have been different experiments of, of trying to uh, animate or activate a different cohort of news consumer, a different group of people who would be more inclined to enlighten debate. Yeah. Um, and, and some of those experiments have succeeded. Uh, you, you know, in general, if we look at Twitter as, as, uh, as a site on which citizens meet and uh, essentially are, are not just debating the news, but kind of making the news as, as, uh, you know, as as a, a news distribution and commentary uh, site, um, you know, it's it's been really successful. I mean, there's uh, uh, 
you know, but even there, I mean, you have silo siloization or, or um, people breaking off into their, uh, you know, uh, sort of little villages. Um, Echo chambers of uh, news. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I, what I what I was too young to foresee when I was 35, but am well aware of, uh, you know, much wiser to the ways of the world and, and really have read much, much, much more history uh, in the last 15 years is that you know, if, if you are trying to describe a large scale phenomenon, be prepared for it to be composed of a lot of good and a lot of bad and for it to be really complicated and for you not to know what the heck it means and is for decades and decades, because that's how large scale phenomena exist. They, uh, you know, we're still trying to figure out what the industrial revolution was and what it did. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's positive and negative impacts. And we still don't have even scholarly agreement yeah. over that. Um, you know, did it lead to rise in GDP and, and decreased misery or did it, you know, create wage slaves, both. So, you know, crowdsourcing is no different. Crowdsourcing is okay. a whole lot of good and bad and, and, you know, and everything in between. Now, I want to ask you, put in a, a, a personal context for you, if I may. Um, to what extent was this a key milestone or a highlight in your career so far? Oh, I mean, it was it was huge. I, I mean, it was, uh, you know, the, the book was quite successful. So, um, you know, it was uh, it was a financially re uh, remunerative project in, in ways that I had not anticipated uh, when I went into journalism. Um, it's not to say journalists can't make money. I tell my students all the time, like, you know, you can make a good middle-class income off of it. But, um, uh, it, you know, so, uh, you know, it paid for a nice house and my daughter's uh, college fund. And, um, but it, much, much more than that, it created a wealth of opportunity. I mean, I traveled all over the world speaking about it. I got to meet amazing people. Um, I wound up, uh, you know, studying at Harvard for a year, uh, being part of, uh, it's called the Neiman Fellowships, which is a journalism fellowship, um, which would not have happened without crowdsourcing, uh, and then led to uh, my current post as a professor here at Northeastern. Um, okay, and so, so does that mean that uh, it, uh, this highlight or this milestone created, actually created or facilitated other milestones to happen? As you just yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's the case. Sure, yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, as a journalist, uh, when you write, uh, when you start to think about writing something, uh, where do you draw your inspiration from? How do you find topics? Um, and that, yeah, what inspires you personally? Oh, boy, it's a tough one, and. I think I'm probably like a lot of journalists, I'm curious about everything. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes you just can't sate your curiosity, you can't satisfy it. And that's probably the thing you should write about because you just can't let it go. Um, crowdsourcing was definitely one of those things. I just, you know, uh, you know, over the years as a, as a journalist, you begin to get uh, you, you almost, you know, you almost become, gosh, not a Geiger counter. Um, what measures tectonic movement? Yeah. Um, a, uh, you know, what measures earthquakes? Uh, a seismograph? Yeah, a seismograph. You sort of almost, you, you, you become a living seismograph and that you, you can, you begin to sense what are tiny little shakes yeah. and what are big shakes and, and what are big movements within the culture as opposed to, you know, what are just kind of fly by night, uh, you know. Is it something, uh, you, yeah. is it something you have or haven't, uh, or is it something you can learn? I, I think, can you teach that? Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, I don't know if you can teach it, but it can be learned. Um, okay. I think it's largely experience. I, I think, you know, trying to figure out what is and is not um, a compelling story to tell okay. to people. Um you know, and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and not every journalist works in that vein, but I, I had, I, you know, sort of fell into that in my career. Okay. Um, but you just, gave, uh, you just talked about yourself, hey, realizing um, 15 years later, I, you read much more on history. Um, you could say becoming a, a, a live seismograph. 
would you say that these are is, is this advice restricted to journalists or could this also be would it be advice you would give at any young person starting their career oh i mean i think i think any young person i mean i i would hope i mean i would say this i mean one thing i i tell my journalism students is that is that you know a a deep and uh you know compulsive curiosity about the world is important for journalists but but more importantly it just makes uh uh it, it just increases one's quality of life i mean you wake up and every day is fun and interesting uh and if you don't have that i i think it's a dull existence so i it, you know as well as uh, you know, it can't help but, uh, you know, assist your ascent uh, or development in any profession to simply understand, you know, to be obsessively interested in the world around you. Um, you know, there's a reason why when, uh, you know, potential employers, uh, you know, and I've put together these this research for, uh, for us here in the journalism department, you know, what do they list as the most desirable qualities in a candidate? And curiosity and creativity are, are always in the top five. Um, so yeah, I, I think independent it's of, Independent of the profession almost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, in fact, yeah, I don't think it, it's, it serves anyone. I mean, it's, you could be a ditch digger, but it still is a, you know, dull existence if, if, you know, you don't spend the rest of the time curious and interested in the world around you. Okay, good. Now, what have been um, the other highlights in your career where you hey, I'm proud of that, that that happened to me? Well, you know, my second book, I mean, any, any book is a huge labor of love. Okay. I mean, I mean, even if you're well compensated for it, uh, you know, the hours you spend on it are, are so immense. Um, and, and so with my second book, I, I co-authored it with uh, the head of the MIT Media Lab, Joey Ito, who's, uh, you know, is no longer at the Media Lab, but um, we wound up spending a good three or four years of pretty intense regular, I mean, we both were doing other things. We were, I was teaching full-time at Northeastern while I was also a visiting scholar at the, at the Media Lab, and, and Joey was, of course, heading the lab, um, you know, but it was a pretty intensive side project for both of us, and, and for me especially, uh, and uh, to be able to spend four years at one of the more magical research institutions, uh, you know, in the world was was incredibly gratifying. I'm, and and I'm really proud of the work that came out of it. I mean, we I I think it's a. And was that a sequel uh, to crowdsourcing, or was that completely? No, no, it was. You know, it was very much. Uh, I mean, there were elements of crowdsourcing in there um, for sure, but it was uh, it was a much there was a much broader premise. Uh, which, in just a few words, is is that the pace of technological progress has far outstripped our cognitive capacity to understand yeah. it, um, uh, and thus you know, the book is called Whiplash: um, How to Survive a Faster Future. Uh, and and that is the idea: is that is that uh, technological progress has not only increased exponentially uh, in really just the last, you know, certainly the last twenty to forty years, but uh, you know, looking. Uh, you know, you see that 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 delta, that that change in the, the rate of technological progress, uh, really start with the industrial revolution and then just pick up and pick up speed at a fairly steady rate. Um, that uh, uh, you know, it, we don't know uh, what we have wrought, what we have created with yeah. these changes. I mean, it's worth just noting, like one quick sort of factoid from the book uh, that. Uh, the rate at which uh, the technology for gene sequencing has advanced as six times that of Moore's law. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the, it, you know, we've gone, the, the cost of, uh, you know, sequencing a genome has gone from a billion dollars in uh, really just the span of a generation uh, since 2000 in the Human Genome Project uh, to, Gosh, I'm not even sure what the current rate is, but I, I I doubt that in terms of just like the cost to a lab, I, I doubt it's over fifty to a hundred dollars, um, you know, and 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 we've seen the results of that play out, uh, uh, you know, uh, across lots of fields. I mean, the the thing I'm obsessed with now, you're asking like, what what where do you take inspiration? Um, I can't get enough of archaeogenetics. 
uh, which is the intersection between archaeology and genetics and and what we've learned, uh, you know, what places like the Max Planck Institute uh, and other ar archaeology and paleontologists are 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 are, are doing with gene sequencing technologies. Jeff, you've opened the door to a completely different topic. So hopefully we can get you back to talk about that in a future program. But it's great to, to, to listen uh, you, to, to how you talk about crowdsourcing. And I think you've, you're, you're living proof of where, where you can get uh, if you're curious and if you uh, provide context. So uh, maybe one last word. Um, sure. How do you want the people um, to remember you? What's what, what's your own brand? How do you want to position that? Oh, I mean, to the extent I have a legacy, it will probably be as a teacher. I mean, I think all teachers feel that way if they love to teach. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to be, um, yeah, I, I, I hope I've inspired students um, to, uh, uh, you know, to not only be curious, um, I guess, but to lead with their heart, to be compassionate first. Um, well, you've taught me a new, couple of new things about crowdsourcing I haven't heard. So I'm very thankful for you to share that with me and the, and the audience. And you have opened the door to a number of great new topics to explore. So thank you so much for that. Great. Okay, thank you, Fritz, for having me on. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.